Hey, everybody, Kim Clark here. And I wanted to kind of, before you get into the episode with Paul, I want to kind of set up a scene a little bit here because it, it's, it's a different ep- kind of episode. It's not interview or conversational like you're used to here at Communicate Like You Give a Damn. It's actually more of a classroom education on some really specific PR techniques that Paul has a unique background and experience in. And there may be some words or some references uh, made in the retelling of his experience with the murder of George Floyd and working behind the scenes on the messaging that surrounded that in the very city where the murder happened. It may be triggering for some. So I want to kind of set this up for you, make sure that you understand that this is a slightly different episode. And it's something that we can take a lot from. There's a lot to process and digest and learn from. So thank you for listening. And here's Paul. Hey, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for returning to Communicate Like You Give a Damn. So today, trigger warning. We're going to be talking about a time that changed a lot of people's lives, uh, a lot of levels of awareness. Um, It shaped and shifted corporations. Uh, It changed how we saw each other when we were starting to come back into offices and work environments. Uh, And it was in the summer of 2020 when George Floyd was murdered. And today's guest was in the middle of it all from a PR narrative messaging standpoint. And we're going to get an idea of behind the scenes of what that was like, what happened, what needed to be fixed. And he has takeaways that all communicators can use that he pulled from that experience and his previous and since experiences that would benefit us all from a crisis communication standpoint, but also in a proactive strategic communication standpoint. So just want to let people know that we're going to be talking about some stuff here. And it's primarily, it's going to be from the communicator's lens but it's on a pretty serious subject. And with that, Paul, thank you for being here. And I would love for you to introduce yourself to everybody. Well, Kim, thanks for bringing me onto your platform and and to have this chance to interact with your regular viewers. Um, My name is Paul Omot, and I grew up in Minneapolis. And I think that's important to this story. I grew up in the city of Minneapolis. I went to Minneapolis public schools. I'm very proud of the fact that I went to the public schools in Minneapolis. Um, I'm from a big family, but I'm also from a police family. And so a lot of people knew my last name through the lens of either my grandpa, who was a St. Paul, longtime St. Paul police officer, or my dad, who was the county sheriff in Hennepin County. And Hennepin County encompasses Minneapolis in, in the suburbs. And so, you know, it's the largest county in Minnesota. And my dad was sheriff for about 28 years. And so what that does to you as a younger person We grew up with a police scanner going on at every floor of our house, okay? So if you grew up in the 60s as the son of a cop in the 70s, police scanners were a normal function of of your house. And so we learned very early on how to listen to calls coming in because you heard the phone calls coming in to dispatch. And then you would hear what was dispatched out. And then your dad could come home at the end of the day or the end of the shift and tell you how things went. And then we'd piece it together by looking at the newspaper or the the TV station or the radio interviews to see how all the communications came together and what the narrative was. And so in a lot of ways, I was kind of born to this, the work I do, uh, about filling in those very comprehensive puzzles of communication. The thing I don't want people to take away from that introduction is this dichotomous thinking I think people think. They say, oh, you're from a police family, therefore X, right? Or, or, or you stood up for George Floyd when he was murdered, and I use the word murdered, right? And so you must be that. And I think we have to kind of think about that tension we hold as communicators so we don't get labeled one way or the other, it's because you can be both and things, right? You're not either or. And I think too many times we take the, the position, especially as our society becomes more kind of contentious on the, on the edges here, that, that you feel like you have to play on one side or the other. But I think in a lot of ways, uh, good communications can bring people together. Good communications can help things 
in society or in our world get better? And I, and I think, Kim, one of the things that impressed me, I, I saw you speak in Toronto at the IBC conference, was your message about being a courageous communicator. And I think there, there comes a time where more of us have to take that stand uh, and put our skills to, to use and not be afraid to, to move forward with it. And I, and I do think that that thing is something we're, we're so used to kind of being speaking from a corporate voice or a non-human voice that it's okay to be human and it's okay to live in tension and it's okay um, to change our mindset. And, and before I kind of throw it back to you, one thing I've changed in the last two years when I write a crisis plan or engage in a crisis with a crisis client, I now put strategy number one is to learn to live with discomfort. The fact mm. that if you don't learn to live with discomfort at the upfront, right? If you think everything is just going to go swimmingly without any type of pushback, you're probably going to be wrong. And so I've been telling my client, hey, we are going to get through this. We can use strategic communications to help us get through this. But strategy number one is to learn to live with some discomfort. And that's okay. It's okay to live in a little bit of tension. We will use strategic communications to get us to where we need to go, but it's not always going to be easy and it's not going to be pretty. And we'll have to change what we think and what other people think as we go through it. And so I tell my clients, we are imperfect people on an imperfect path, but if we have a good vision to where we want to go, we'll get there. And that's kind of, kind of my background it is my life changed a lot on that May 25th, 2020, when that happened. Um, because it really called into question what I thought and believed about my hometown. Mm -hmm. That dissonance, yes. That, that dissonance and... was jarring. And Kim, if I could describe that moment of dissonance, just to think about this. Um, it was Memorial Day, right? So it's a Monday and it's a day off. And we had just had a, a barbecue dinner at our house and I'd cleaned up and I was just kind of sitting um, and I kept getting things on my phone and it was from people I knew saying, have you seen this? And it was the video of George Floyd being murdered, essentially. Oh, my and gosh. I, and I watched, I mean, this was literally within 20 minutes of, of the, the video, right? And my first thought was, well, where the heck is this going on? You know, it didn't occur to me that this was Minneapolis. And then two more people sent me the same video and they said, are you working on this? And I'm like, I literally watched that video two times before I picked out the fact that, oh my God, this is Minneapolis. This, this is where I grew up. And I immediately kind of started doing the things that I do as a communicator. I, I looked at what was out there in the media. I looked at social media and I found it was at Cup Foods. Now, Cup Foods is a well-known kind of South Minneapolis um, convenience store, for lack of a better word, but it's across the street from a park where I grew up playing sports. So after a game, you would ride your bike or, you know, and get Gatorade or whatever. And everything just, it just felt so weird to me to know that this happened there on a spot that I was familiar with, but worse yet, it happened in Minneapolis. And that was that moment of dissonance of this happened someplace else, not here. This type of, um, abject kind of racism, if you want to, if you want to term what happened just out of a racial element to it, because there was a racial element to it, that someone did this in broad daylight and a man literally begged for his life in front of children and they suffocated him. Um, and so you see that in that moment of it, you, you're, you're literally in disbelief. And the sad thing is, Kim, at that moment, I had, I've been doing crisis communications for over 30 years here in the Twin Cities, and I grew up in it. So I, I tell people, I'm 57 years old. I've been doing this for 57 years, right? Um, my, my thought process was this, though. I have done big events in the Twin Cities in terms of protests and when things go wrong. So the Super Bowl had protests, and I was in charge of the protest kind of interactions. The Twin Cities Marathon has had protests, and I've been in charge of the, you know, handling the protests and setting up First Amendment zones and all those, all that multi-jurisdictional things. You work with police and fire and ambulance to make sure everybody's safe and sound, and the messaging is all aligned and all that stuff. And so we've had big events in the Twin Cities that have used, you know, people like me to help calm them down. And my first thought was, oh, this is great. I'm not great, but hey, I know there's a deep bench of people here who, who know how to handle something like this. And that was probably my first mistake was that those people were equipped in that moment to put communication strategy into play. And they very clearly did not. And so what I was gathering was, you know, okay, we'll give 
will give the city of Minneapolis and its PR people and the county and its public relations people and its outreach people 24 hours to see what they can do. And it didn't get better. In fact, it got worse. And there was a total void of communication. And so um, I grew up in Minneapolis. I just live outside the city now, but, but both my boys live, my adult children lived in Minneapolis, two brothers, two sisters live there. And like a lot of family and friends still live in the city boundaries. And you're watching this and everybody's calling you going like, what are your friends doing to stop this? You know, from a communication standpoint, like how are they? And the first night came, you know, and you saw that the police station get burned down. Right. And that's a jarring image, no matter if you're pro or anti or whatever you are, it's a jarring image. And that signaled something that this was bigger than, than just this little incident. I, I think believe it was that building, um, correct me if you know, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not remembering correctly, but I believe it was one of the walls of that building that somebody spray painted, are you listening yet? Right, exactly. It, and Kim, you're absolutely right. And, and here's, here's again, you know, you look at anything in terms of crisis communication, and it's this thing I, I drill into all my clients is the first hour is a critical hour, right? Get your communication strategy set pick your framing, pick your messaging, uh, make sure you've got everything in place in that first hour because the golden hour matters. And if you look at what it, the city of Minneapolis and the police department put out in that first hour when that happened, their first press release indicates that a man had a medical incident and was taken to the hospital. Now, when the public sees that and they see the videotape, it's night and day difference as to the narrative. We see the narrative and how they could have that thing of saying, this was a medical incident without all the intervening issues in there. Um, that was, you know, that first lie, that first misstep set everything into motion because people of good conscience, as I say, saw that and, and said this, how can this be in my city? And this is what we've been telling you. Are you listening to us that this is what we face every day? And again, for me, that was that dissonance as, as a, as a white person, um, I never faced that, right, in terms of interactions with public safety people. And, you know, are you listening? No, they weren't listening. And, and in fact, instead of listening, instead of using communications to build those channels, we watch them utterly fail in that regard. And so that's... Oh, how did you get involved? Well, so what was the, What was the trigger for you? Well, so, I mean, again, understand that happened on Monday, Tuesday night, things get even worse. On Tuesday night, the first statement anybody of any kind of import within the city of Minneapolis made was at three in the morning. And that's when the mayor of Minneapolis came out because I kept saying, oh, they're going to come out. Don't worry about it. You know, I don't need to get involved because they're not a client of mine currently. You know, I don't have the relationship with that current regime. Um, and then then you're into Wednesday and the same thing happens. And again, people are calling me saying, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I'm going to go help clean up in the morning, you know, like everybody else grab a broom and clean up Lake Street or whatever it was. Um, and literally on Thursday night, this was, you know, nights into it. I turned to my wife and I said, I can't sit and watch this anymore. You know, I, I cannot be on the sidelines of this anymore. And I, I said, how early can I call the governor's office on Friday and start rattling some cages? Because there, this is this is, there's no end in sight to this. There was no communication strategy. There was no outlet for people to kind of express themselves. So on Friday morning, I did call the governor's office. I called a friend there in the governor's office who I'd worked with on, again, big events. And I said, and if I can, I don't want to use bad language on the podcast, but I said, what the F are you doing? What is your plan? And the response was, well, we think we're doing great. And I, I kind of said, well, let me just tell you this, in my opinion, and, I, and I've written about this and I, and I'll, I always joke that I stayed calm. I, I said, you guys are, you guys are committing professional suicide. You're committing political suicide. You're committing societal suicide here because you don't have a path forward with your communications. You're not doing well. You need to take a hard look at this and you need to bring in some experts to help you. And the, my friend said, well, what would you do? I said, give me an hour and I'll write you a plan. And if you disagree with what I lay out in my plan, you can tell me to go away and you can watch your city burn because that's what we had been doing. And so literally, Kim, what I did is I called four people that have done this kind of higher level communications stuff with me. I called each of them and I said, hey, John, hey, Ted, hey, Laura, hey, Bob, will you come and help me with, and they all said, absolutely. We can't believe what we're seeing. 
So we got into Google Docs and we wrote a plan. It took us about an hour. We all each took a section and we wrote it. And I sent it to the governor's office. And they said, okay, uh, tag, you're it. Can you embed two people into our center, into our op center? And so we did. And so we embedded, and again, remember this was still COVID time. So you couldn't bring five people in there and there had to be distancing and all that kind of stuff. So two people got embedded in the op center for the state to give communications advice. And we knew that we weren't going to call every shot, right? We knew that, but we knew that we could, with the skill sets we had, we could be the trusted advisors in the room. And so we embedded two people there and the rest of us were out and about, literally. Um, we had monitoring. Again, when, when you're managing big events, you have to have monitoring systems. So I'm, I'm monitoring stuff on social media. My friend, you know, John and Ted are doing the same thing. So we can see everything that's going on. Interestingly, you know, I found Unicorn Riot, which is a kind of independent media source that just went out and put up cameras at the hotspots and let them run. And you could just see what was going on. There was no editing to it. There was no whatever. And those producers went out there and set up cameras. And so we had great intelligence there. You can also tap into the, uh, the, the Department of Transportation cameras, the traffic cams, if you know how to do that. They're the public documents, essentially. We were watching things on, on public, public venues to see what was going on so that we could help communicate better. Um, and so from that Friday on, we started being embedded into the service and helping them with strategy and helping them with things that seem so simple to you and I as communicators and should have been simple to them as professional communicators, but weren't. And so we started encouraging them, A, strategy number one is to involve experts. You should never manage your own crisis. If you're in crisis, the worst person to handle it is yourself. And they were all taking this extremely uh, personal. And so they don't have a clear line of sight as to what's going on. The comment when I said, what are you guys doing? They said, we think we're doing fine. I'm like, are you crazy, right? You weren't doing fine. Look at the world's watching you. They're watching you implode. And they thought they were doing well. They shouldn't have and been And this managed. is a point that I want to remind people, like take notes. He's going to go through key takeaways. And so that was the first one. Don't manage your own crisis. So I just Never want to make sure everybody own crisis, takes right. Take notes, and, take notes and, for this. And be mature enough to involve experts. You know what I mean? Sure, we're dealing with the people in the governor's office and his cabinet, but it's okay to, to have, bring in people who might know more than you do, right? And, and they, to their credit, they did. Now, they had lots of missteps along the way, but, but eventually they, they said, okay, we're going to listen to these people. And again, I tell my clients, you won't agree with every one of my ideas and everything I write for you or whatever. But at least you're getting the perspective of someone who knows how to bring you through this. And so right away, we started kind of infusing messages. And Kim, here's the kind of the, the crazy thing about dealing with a crowd, right? I look at any crowd or mob or whatever you want to call that was going on in terms of an adoption scale, right? You look at any time there's, a, you know, you introduce a new ice cream, you introduce a watch, there's always kind of a wave of how decisions get made by people in that consumer group or whatever, however you want to call it. We knew between zero and 3% of that population were kind of the early adopters, were the kind of the people that'd be most prone to do something. We knew there weren't, if just say that the, the crowd was, you know, 10,000 people, we knew there weren't 10,000 people who were going to do, be doing violent things and burning down buildings and all the kind of chaotic stuff that was so harmful, right? We knew about 3% were. And I think that number held true when you look at the number of people who were arrested, right? They were prone to violence. Our job was to stop that 3% from going from the kind of the innovator early to the early adopters, which is the next like 10 to 15% of the population. And we already saw day after day that the next group of people was becoming more emboldened because they saw that first group of doing it. So the first thing we did is we worked with the police to identify the professional protesters who had come from other parts of the, of the, of the US really. You can pick them out because most of them brag about going to go protest someplace or going to do anarchy. So we knew there are anarchists that came in and you can find them on, the, the funniest thing Kim, anarchists are incredibly organized for people who believe in anarchy. Uh, they will brag about, hey, I'm going to Minneapolis to, to make my mark or I'm gonna go do burn X, Y, and Z. And we were turning those people into the police because I needed to take out that 3% that was making things worse. And so we stopped the adoption scale essentially by, by working kind of behind the scenes to find that. 
there's a number of different ways you do that with just with Facebook posting by knowing this audience pretty well of dealing with protesters a lot. There's people that do this kind of as their hobby or as their whatever. And some are peaceful, some are not. And so it's about finding those people that are saying that they're going to do something that's violent and stopping that. Because that is one thing I think universally that was unhelpful was to have those people in the audience. And so we were putting messages out to the police to say, this is where they're going to be because what we knew they were doing in the crowds was that they would get a crowd going in a certain neighborhood and then they would go peel off from the crowd when the police came to the crowd to go do something wrong when there was no people looking, right? And so they were, they're very clever, kind of a cat and mouse game, but we were out thinking them because they were bragging about what they were doing. So the next thing we started to do was to look at it as an adoption scale and cut out the most violent people so that we could have people protest legitimately. I mean, there was a legitimate reason to protest. I mean, let's, let's be honest. We should have all been out there protesting that. We should have been doing it peacefully and not burning down police stations and all that other kind of stuff. But there was a legitimate need to outlet. So the next thing we started to do was, you know, one of the other strategies I talk about was to empower the media to tell our story they had not pitched the media any story so far. So on Friday, we started pitching the media on how to, how to get peacefully arrested. How do you do that? And so we had three, three stations, TV stations and the newspapers do a story on, hey, you want to go protest and it's you're conscious to get arrested for this? Here's where you can go do it peacefully and not be harassed, essentially. And you know what happened that day on Friday? That's when they started to people lined up to kind of get their, their, their right to be arrested. As crazy as that sounds, we had to tell people how to do that. If you go here, you'll be fine. You won't be mistreated. And so we empowered the media to do those storytelling and through social media. The other tip I talk about in, in things I've written and stuff is, and I really have to throw shade at the police for this. Uh, they took their best and biggest megaphone to help calm this down and they turned it against themselves. And they did that by targeting reporters. Not only did they target reporters by arresting, like they arrested a CNN reporter doing a live shot one day on the air. I Think remember about that. You remember that, right? And just mm -hmm. how jarring that is. Someone who is trying to calm things down and you come and arrest him on the air. Um, they were also shooting rubber bu bullets at reporters on purpose, even when they knew they were reporters. And I mean, the reporters were, for the most part, neutral parties just trying to cover something. And here you had the police. And so legitimately, uh, there were several heated discussions uh, within the op center to say, you better stop shooting at, at reporters because you need them. They are part of your solution here. You better empower them. And so when you look at what happened during that, we, we empowered people who weren't mainline hard news reporters uh, to go out and do stories because we knew they were good reporters and they had good rapport with people. And so we empowered, like, uh, there's a Channel 4 WCCO CBS reporter, a sports guy, to go out and do stories on how to get arrested and things like that. He did a ph phenomenal job. He kind of became like a, almost a folk hero because of how folksy he did that. And we empowered a guy from Channel 9 to do the same thing. So we were pitching him the stories, and here's how where you can go shoot this story. Here's how you can tell this story. And so all of a sudden, we had this mega megaphone called the media to help us during the media. And so, you know, the strategy of walking toward the media in crisis can kind of seem jarring to some people because the media is the enemy. But in this case, the media was the ones we needed to tell the story. It, unless the police wanted to be out there, you know, weeks and weeks later, you know, on riot lines, you needed those reporters. So we empowered them to do that. The other thing we had a, a strong discussion on is, and this is one of the things that I when I do a crisis training, the first thing I talk about is my three-step process, which is to claim it, name it, frame it. That first part of it is to claim it as who's in charge of this. And that's always a problem. Um, and in this case, we had, we had the mayor of Minneapolis and the governor of the state of Minnesota pointing fingers at each other as to who was kind of in charge. And they are people of the same political party, right? So this isn't a partisan statement. This was two adult males arguing over whether the paperwork was filled out right to call in the National Guard, whether this was done right to do something. And they're throwing barbs at each other as opposed to being adults and saying, hey, uh, this is who needs, this is the structure that needs 
take place. This is the group that's in charge of this. This is our crisis. This is what we're handling. This is what you need to handle. And so it's the, what we call the claim of the crisis. Whose is it to manage? Because once you claim it, it is yours, no, no one else's. And if it's, if it's your duty to do that, if you are the only person who should be doing that, you should be in charge of it. And we saw a lot of this kind of finger pointing and kind of grandstanding as opposed to being an adult and figuring out, I do this, I do this, you do this, you do that. And so we had to have some tough discussions uh, led by the people in the op center to say, you just need to be doing this right now. And so one of those other things we talk about is claiming the crisis the right way. Who's in charge of this? Who's going to make this message? And who do we empower? So what that leads to once you do that is that you can then the other strategy is, is, is using aligned voices to tell the stories. And when I say aligned voices, it would have been really great if Minneapolis police and fire had gotten along and could talk to each other and communicate effectively with each other. They couldn't. It had been really great if the Minnesota State Patrol could have done the same thing with the Minneapolis Police Department or the St. Paul Police Department. But they could not speak with an aligned voice. They hadn't even though I've done, and that, like the Twin Cities Marathon is run between the two cities, right? So you have to coordinate between two different counties, two different cities, you know, multiple neighborhoods, all this stuff. You're doing 26 mile race through all these cities. You can do that if you care to do it, but they could not speak with an aligned voice. The same message at the same time through multiple channels. And so we worked with them heavily on that Friday to say, this is the message for this hour. The second thing, the other thing we started to set up was a regular cadence of, hey, you know what? They have to know when the mayor is coming out to give a press conference and the governor and the, the fire chief. And, the, and so we put them on a regular cadence of press events. I mean, how many people, Kim, do you think were watching the press event with the mayor that first night at three in the morning, right? What impact did that have of waiting until the city burned down to come out and make a statement? No one knew what to expect. No one, everybody's waiting for someone and you had to wait till 3 a.m. That's kind of ridiculous. And so we put them on a regular cadence of communication. Talk about this, extend the story, tell people what you need them to do. The funny thing is if you tell people what they need to do or what they can do and you give them a vision, they're likely to follow it. If you give them nothing, right? You don't feed it they'll tend to do whatever they want. And that's what we saw those first three days. There was no guidance. So if you were into the protests, you just kept doing whatever you wanted. But then you think of the people that were kind of stuck in their homes, you know, like my, my, my two adult children, my brothers and my sisters, you could not get the police department to return your call if the house down the street was burning down to come out and put out the fire because they weren't answering calls. They weren't communicating at all. And so here you had people forming their own communication network within cities using Facebook Live and Facebook feeds and neighborhood, you know, neighborhood apps to communicate with each other because there was no one from an official capacity to do that. And so we started seeding those communications channels too of, hey, we know this has been dispatched here or, hey, this fire truck will be in this neighborhood there. And you know, trying to better coordinate that to people who weren't part of the protests, you know, they might, they, they were just trying to go about their lives and figure that out. And so we start peeling all that back and adding some structure to it. And then you start having some messages in there. And part of one of those messages you've brought up was, we have to be listening to this. We have to take this seriously. This is, this is not something. And so we needed to do a more of a better job of community engagement. And there's, there's this concept that I, that I do in my classes called proximal communications. And proximal communications says that those that are the most deeply impacted by things, you know, so if you think of a circle with concentric circles going out, those in the deepest circle should have the most personal channel of communications to them. That means that you get out of your car. That means that the governor gets out of his office and you go meet with people face to face and you have a presence with those most directly affected. And we had to have tell people that you will be listened to and you will be in a dialogue otherwise they, they are shouting into the void and getting angry and anger when they're not getting that and so the concept of proximal communications we started to empower that on friday and saturday and what that looked like is that we were getting volunteers from a lot of different walks of life to say how can i go help i'll be a listener i will go be a good role model out in these out out in the city and on the streets and this was clergy, this was business leaders, 
of all stripes, colors, politics. This was Minnesota Vikings, Minnesota Twins, Minnesota Wild Hockey players, right? These were people from acting and music and stuff, the vibrant kind of art scene in, in the Twin Cities said, what do we do? And we said, we're going to have you guys out and we spread them out throughout the city to be listeners, to be role models, to say, hey, our organization understands we'll be listening to this. And you look at some of the, the Minnesota Vikings players really stepped up. You look at Matt Dumba, who's a wild hockey player, person of color, who really stepped up and said, hey, I'm there with you. I face this too. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to help you rebuild Lake Street after it was burnt down. That's a different element that you can program into a response. And you have to give those ladies and gentlemen credit for that. And the clergy who started to go out. And so that other thing, that proximal communication is that you put people, when people are in pain, you have to meet that pain with a person. It can't be through a tweet, right? It sounds really obvious, but it's really hard to go out there and interface with people in public that way. So other, our other lesson was to get out from behind your, your kind of your bunker, right? Whatever it was and get out there and engage with the people to do that listening because people were in pain, rightfully so. And that's a clear lesson. And Kim, there's, a, there's another lesson if we got time to kind of wind up this story a little bit. We had gotten things kind of calmed down Friday and Saturday. And there was a, there was a kind of a prayer service on the 35W Bridge on the edge of downtown. And so the 35W Bridge, if you remember, was a bridge that collapsed a couple of years prior. It collapsed one day, sent cars down to the bottom of the river and, you know, lots of kind of mayhem and death. So they'd rebuilt the bridge. It become kind of a gathering spot. And so there was a big prayer service there. And, and the funny, the funny, the interesting thing to me was my wife and daughter were there. They were there for the peaceful kind of prayer service to let, hey, let's, let's listen to each other. Let's come together, whatever your, whatever point of view on this is, but let's be people first. And this people are there on the bridge, mostly on one side of the traffic lane because the bridge was closed. And all of a sudden this uh, gas tanker truck comes onto the bridge as people are still on the bridge and it's coming across the bridge and there's, 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 you can watch the videos of it online. You can see the pictures of it. And you know, the, the truck comes up over the hill of the bridge that kind of goes up and it comes to a stop and they pull the guy out and they, he gets the crap beat out of him by the, by people that were on the bridge. And then people settle down and said, not here's the thing about crisis communication, right? The initial thought, the Speaker of the Minnesota House, so the number three person in Minnesota state government structure, tweets out immediately that this is Russian terrorists, right? So you, exactly, the exact reaction. And so we're there running things and we have our people embedded in the app center and we're, we're told that the Director of Public Safety is gonna go make a statement declaring that this is indeed Russian terrorism. And, and I said, whoa, 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 whoa hold the phone. We can't have another thing where we're saying something that is so far out of the realm of whatever. We've got time to tell the right story. And so part of crisis communication is to kind of speak truth to power. And again, we had to step into this and say, you guys, you're not going to go to that podium. You're going to stop tweeting out things or tell your political allies to tweet out that this is terrorism. And Kim, here's the crazy thing. Here's the true story of the guy in the truck. Is an image of really people scattering as this truck's coming through, you know, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people on a bridge. You can't go anywhere because you'd have to jump off the bridge into the river, right? So it's terrifying. Um, the bridge came onto the highway legally because the state didn't shut down all the entrance ramps to the highway. And so this truck had deli just delivered gas. And so quickly we jumped on the MnDOT cameras to say, okay, we know this area. Where did this truck come from? And we see that it came in on Lindell Avenue. And I'm like, okay, let's look at the cameras. Let's go back. And it just made a delivery of gas to a, a, a black owned gas station on 43rd and Lindell in Minneapolis. Now it just so happens that the owner of that gas station is a friend of mine. And I called him, I said, Lonnie, did a truck just deliver gas to you? And he said, oh, Paul, yes. I have not been able to serve my customers for this whole week. No one can get gas, right? Because no one's going to deliver to this neighborhood in Minneapolis gas. There was one driver in the whole state of Minnesota who said he would deliver gas to me on this morning. And he was a, an immigrant from the Ukraine. And he's my friend and I treat him well. And he treats me well. Of all the drivers, only one would do it. And he came and he dropped off gas so his, 
Monty's customers could have them. And he got back, start heading back, and some protesters started throwing stuff at his truck. So he kind of speeds quickly and goes, I'm going to get out of here as fast as I can. And innocently, mistake, goes onto the bridge that was wide open, not knowing that. So the true story is one of a, a, a new American, right? An immigrant doing the right thing and helping his his African-American business owner friend to deliver gas to that neighborhood, the only person who would do it. And here we're calling him a terrorist or bringing in this Russian element. And so we had to speak that truth to, to power and say, no, you cannot have that narrative. Here is the real narrative. And that's, that's again, that dichotomy of that, you know, you have to live in the tension of this a little bit, but you also have to be smart enough to know, okay, let's, let's check our facts before we go forward here because that would have thrown the whole thing back into a chaotic orb. If everybody thought, oh my God, I can't go protest because I'm going to be hit by terrorist bombs or whatever the, the thought process was. So that's the kind of thing that, again, in terms of crisis learnings, you have to take the time to tell the right story, right? And I think there was a much better story there about what was really happening that day. As terrifying as that was, it was an honest mistake by someone who was trying to do the right thing in his mind without any ill intent, a person of good conscience. And again, the knee jerk reaction in the official story that this was a Russian terrorist was just, it, it was just bizarre to us that that's, again, the speaker of the house puts that out in Minnesota, it gets listened to. And we have to go refute that the number three person in state government and say, no, this is not the story. And no, we're not gonna let you go to the podium and make this announcement. We're going to tell a different story at the podium because this is about goodness in society, not badness in society. And that's sticking that to the facts. Yeah, it's <clears throat> sticking to the facts, even if the mm -hmm. facts aren't convenient to what you think happened. You know what I mean? It's, it's mm -hmm. just that type of thing. And Kim, the so other... we're going to, yeah. So um, we're, we're going to wrap up as yeah. this part one, because I have more questions for you. <laughs> so there, there's going to be a need for a part two. Yeah, but I wanted to ask, like, <clears throat> and you can include your your kind of final thoughts for everything you just shared in in response to this question as well. And it's something I ask everybody: is that what does communicating like you give a damn sound like? So when we then when there is, <laughs> whew, something like this that happens at a larger, or smaller, or similar scale. Yeah. What what ultimately did it come down to? that you saw was missing and that needed to be added that was basically communicating like the governor the mayors the first responders etc that they gave a damn about what was going on right kim i, I think you kind of hit the, the hit it early when you said are you listening that kind of thing that you had to communicate that we are going to listen to you that your voice matters that we have to recognize that there was a problem that we couldn't say that there wasn't a problem here. And I think that was kind of the reaction of, you know, what happened to George Floyd kind of quote unquote, wasn't a problem. Right. And the police took it as us versus them. Right. And I don't think that's the case. Right. I think the case was that we needed to relook. Everybody had to have that dissonance moment where you go like, what are we doing here? It was like that moment I had when I saw the video and it, and it took me twice to watch that till I figured out it was in my hometown. Right. It's like, what, what is happening here? And so I think you got to give a damn enough to say that I might have thought things wrong. I need to listen better to myself. But I also think that that give a damn thing is to say, I will step in. And I, I, and I think a lot more people have to step into what they're seeing in our country. Um, and again, it's okay to push back against the bullies. You can do it peacefully. You can do it well, right? You can do it against the people that want to pick on the underclass, the under categories, whatever, you know, they want to otherize everybody. It's okay to step up and have a point of view. Um, I know there's a larger discussion. I know we're short on time. We, you could look at in terms of, the, of trust in society and where it's going. If you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, what it tells you is that big institutions are becoming less trusted, but things that are smaller and closer in that you can touch and feel are gaining more trust and people expect them to have a point of view. They expect them to speak up. And I think that's the opportunity. 
no matter what you are. So you're looking to your employee, your employer, you're looking to small governments, you know, your local unit of government to speak up and have a point of view. And it's okay. We don't have to try to be politically correct, not to offend anybody. Strategy number one, learn to live with the discomfort of doing the right thing. And that's okay. It might be a little sticky, but we have to do it. You got to give it. And I really, and I really appreciate your speaking truth to power. And that's what we're going to pick up in part two. Where can people find you or continue to learn from you? You know, the the easiest way is on LinkedIn uh, is to find me on LinkedIn, Paul Omot. I have a website, uh, omotandassociates.com. You can find me on the World Wide Web. My last name is not a common last name, uh, and so it's pretty easy to find typically. Uh, it's O-M-O-D-T. If you type that in, you're going to find me in like one or two clicks. Um, and <laughs> I love what I do, and I love empowering people through better communications. Thank you for you know, meeting me and talking with me in Toronto. I'm so yeah. glad that we crossed paths so we can... We can share this experience, uh, this life-changing, global shifting experience, uh, learning more about it from the inside. So there's more to talk about here, and I look forward to our part two. Thanks for being here, Paul. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. So what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicatelikeyougiveadampodcast.com and set up a one-on-one strategy session. And until next time, let's keep taking care of each other.